uh, welcome uh, formality uh, and address the distinguished uh, presence here of uh, Professor Shavik Bhattacharya, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor uh, Krishnan Bala Subramaniam, uh, distinguished alumnus of uh, Bits Pilani, Professor Barai, the director of the Pilani campus, many other distinguished academies, academics and people who have joined us. Uh, let me first of all say that this is a very privileged and delightful occasion for me, mainly because this event recognizes and celebrates the achievements of two distinguished teachers come administrators in BITS, uh, Professor uh, Venkateshwaran and Professor V. Krishnamurti. I didn't have much uh, occasions to interact with Professor Krishnamurti, but I had many, many occasions to interact with Professor Venkateshwaran on many a fora dealing with policy, planning, higher education issues, and so on and so forth. I would also like to take this opportunity to uh, compliment uh, and appreciate the wonderful gesture of uh, Professor Krishnan Bala Subramanyam for sponsoring this uh, lecture series in honor of two distinguished teachers. I think uh, all I can say, Professor Bala Subramanyam, is that this is a gesture worth emulating for any and every alumni of Bits Milan. Okay, um, let, now coming to the uh, lecture. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, Professor Shavik Bhattacharya and others have raised your expectations. We all know that uh, it's always a challenge to live up to uh, expectations, uh, you know, in the arena of cricket and so on. When Mr. Kohli is expected to perform well because of uh, some kind of reputation, he's many a times lets us down. So this is not only applicable to cricket, but it's also applicable to other arenas of uh, activity. Uh, my lecture today is uh, going to be a, a semi-popular lecture. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to convince the non-chemistry community that uh, chemistry at times is lost in structures, tongue-twisting tongue names, and so on. So I will skirt all these and try to communicate with you uh, in something uh, which is easy to uh, follow and something with which you might be remotely familiar but need to establish much closer uh, familiarity. So my lecture today is uh, really going to be uh, some musings on directions and opportunities for chemistry, but I dare say that you will also see in my lecture opportunities for all practitioners of science cutting across uh, disciplines and uh, domains. The starting point for me is to share with you the dimensionality of chemistry uh, and focus on what I like to call matters that matter. And I begin with a quote from a Canadian motivational uh, speaker and a scholar, Brian Tracy. Uh, he, his quote is, it doesn't matter where you are coming from. So for chemists, it doesn't matter whether you are a physical chemist, organic chemist, quantum chemist, polymer chemist, what have you. What is important for us in chemistry community, also applicable to other branches of science is where you are going or where we are going. And that is going to be really the basic theme of my lecture today. Uh, it's very conventional to give some structure to the presentation. Uh, I have uh, identified here four buckets that uh, I'm going to uh, talk about. But frankly speaking, given the time constraints, I will only be covering two aspects. Uh, the first is the chemistry, which is generally known as a molecular science. It is a molecular science because it deals, deals with atoms, electrons, and molecules. But this uh, area of science which deals with things very, very small has planetary level implications. And I'm going to provide you a connect of chemistry at molecular level with events at the planetary level. The second part I will, of course, cover is uh, scan the horizon and try to project 
that the chemistry's future lies in repositioning itself as sustainability science. So let me begin with uh, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, some of you who have heard me before have seen this. Uh, the quote says, chemistry ought not to be for chemists alone. This is not in the statement of a chemist. Miguel de Unamuno, the well-known Spanish philosopher. It's a philosopher saying that chemistry ought to be for everybody. And inspired by this few years ago, uh, we wrote an editorial in Science, and you can see the title, which says, Chemistry Embraced by All. In the last five or six years, our endeavor has been that chemistry is essential for every learner. Chemistry is essential for every citizen. And I hope at the end of my lecture, uh, you will get uh, some feel of what motivates me uh, to uh, give this lecture and particularly to uh, plead for chemistry for every learner. So the main reason for this is that chemistry is a discipline which deals with life, it deals with universe, and just about it deals with everything. And I show you a picture here of an imaginary uh, imaginary network, neuron network in, in the human brain. And you can see that it almost has infinite connectivities. I like to call it as chemistry connectome. And what this chemistry connectome does is that it defines chemistry's unlimited disciplinary approach. So that's fundamental. One of the important things about chemistry is that it offers avenues of unlimited interdisciplinarity. There is a lot of talk about promoting interdisciplinarity these days. Well, if you really want to practice the art of interdisciplinarity, chemistry offers you a great platform. The other point I wish to make is that uh, chemistry, to me certainly, but to almost everybody, is a source of happiness. And this is not my statement. I have here a quote from Linus Pauling, one of the iconic scientists of the 20th century, and you know the winner of uh, two Nobel Prizes and so on. He put it very simply, I feel sorry for people who do not know anything about chemistry. They are missing an important source of happiness. So learn chemistry, spread happiness, and share happiness. That's the message. Now, my lecture, I want to uh, begin with a hypothetical conversation that might have taken place in the 17th century. Why, is it, why 17th century? Because 17th century is generally identified with the beginning of modern science. And you see here Francis Bacon, uh, science for many, many centuries was known as Baconian science. So the modern science really owes it uh, to the ideas and the proposals that Bacon made. Uh, on the right-hand side at the top, uh, you see Robert Boyle, again, in the 17th century. Uh, most of you are familiar from your high school science education on the gas laws, which are associated with Boyle. But what you may not know is that it is generally believed that it was Robert Boyle who coined the name chemistry. So whatever inheritance we have of what we call today chemistry is to a very large extent uh, to the identification of the field of chemistry and name itself by Robert Boyle. What was the conversation? And that's my starting point. These two gentlemen uh, talk and their talk goes as follows. One of them says, our air is clean, our water is pure, we all get plenty of exercise, Everything we eat is organic and free range, but something is just not right. This is a conversation in the 17th century. And the other person then replies, well, nobody lives past 30 and lots of things in life are missing. Well, we are today in the 21st century and let's reflect for a moment and see what has happened in the intervening centuries. What has changed? How it has changed? Why it has changed? Let me begin by saying that chemical sciences have advanced human development, particularly with regard to wealth, health, and survival. 
and the figures speak of how in the last three centuries a tremendous change or changes have occurred. You know, in the 18th century beginning, global GDP was 1 trillion. Today, global uh, GDP is over 100 trillion. Life expectancy that the two humans were talking about was 30 years in 18th century. It is 73 years in 2022 and well poised to uh, reach a milestone of 100 uh, by the end of this century. World population uh, was 1 billion uh, in the 18th century. It is 8 billion at the moment and growing. Uh, uh, I think it might touch 10 billion before it stabilizes. There are various projections in this regard. So let me ask or share with you something basic. We take it for granted, but we never uh, pay any attention. Let me ask you, how are we around today? How are we surviving today? And I say this in the context of the fact that nature's capacity for nitrogen fixation, and nitrogen fixation is essential, as we all know, for producing food. The nature's capacity of nitrogen fixation can only support 2 billion people on the planet. How is it that 8 billion of us are around? And while the world may not have complete food security, but food production-wise, we are quite okay. We, we have enough food for 8 billion people uh, on the planet. How it has happened? And I just want to show you what made it possible. Several things, but first and foremost is that we have food for everybody today on the planet. And you can see that uh, fertilizers made it possible. I will have something to talk about it later. Uh, we have shelter for majority of people in the world. Uh, I just show you what enabled it, a cement plant. Uh, mobility has become a fundamental element in a rapidly globalizing world. And uh, we need uh, for our mobility fossil fuels today. Uh, although their use is questionable, but uh, we have it and that made it possible. Uh, we need energy and I show you a coal power plant. So it is not chemistry alone, but chemistry in concert with other sciences and particularly engineering and technology has provided the main engine of growth. But you can, detect, you can see here that chemistry has been uh, fundamentally important in all these endeavors. So to sum it up, uh, chemistry has enabled access to breathtaking array of new materials and objects. Uh, very, many of them are familiar to you, uh, including pharmaceuticals for health. Uh, so contrib uh, chemistry's contribution in concert with other branches has been in changing life and lifestyles. Uh, and of course, in these applications of chemistry, interdisciplinarity was essential. Well, so it's something which is worth celebrating that chemistry has enabled uh, many advances. Some of them I have pointed out. But it has also enabled unfolding of many side effects. And I will not go into the details, but I will just give you a flavor of what these side effects are. First, look at the state of the planet and the world. Look at the global environment. Pollution has reached unacceptable level, land, sea, air. Biodiversity loss and accelerated extinction. Every day, every moment, some living species on our planet are becoming extinct. That's the outcome of all this advancement that we had. Uh, I don't have to talk to you about climate change. Every other week or every other month, in some part of the world, there is a ma major climatic event uh, leading to uh, very emergent uh, situations. Uh, I will not touch upon the economic, political, and social implications because uh, that is also something which has surfaced, whether it is uh, conflict, violence, inequalities, population, the challenge of huge urbanization, chaotic cities, and so on and so forth. What about the state of human body and mind? Uh, again, uh, big challenges uh, as far as human body is concerned. We have just witnessed uh, the ravages of the epidemic. 
particularly COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there is a challenge of non-communicable diseases, aging, and geriatric population is a huge, huge challenge. So on one side, we celebrate increase in life expectancy, but it has also come with a side effect that uh, providing reasonable health care and quality of life to the geriatric population is a huge challenge. And of course, we are witnessing in last couple of decades, huge challenges associated with behavior and mental health uh, issues. So having achieved a lot, which I've shared with you in the last few centuries, um, what has been its cost? And for my uh, discussion on sustainability, let's first reflect on what cost we have paid. Uh, first of all, let us recognize that all material used on our planet is chemically produced. And let us ask, is it sustainable? And I'll give you two examples, uh, which uh, are absolutely uh, telling examples. You know, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has crossed the threshold of 1,415 ppm. What is so holy about 415 ppm? Because modeling studies have shown that when we, once we cross the threshold of 14, uh, 415 ppm, we are well on way to have two degree temperature rise by the end of this century. And you know that the recent models on atmospheric research have shown that this uh, threshold may be reached much sooner than the end of the century. And I don't have to share with an enlightened audience like this what catastrophic effect it will have uh, the two degree temperature rise on our planet. And quite likely the life will become unsustainable. You know, there are various predictions, but I don't want to burden you with that. The second important thing is that there is rapid depletion of lithium, often called white gold and rare earths. And I'll show you a graphic a little later, but first let me show this, uh, the two degree temperature rise. Uh, you know, for 800,000 years, 800,000 years, nearly a million years, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide was steady, as you can see from this graphic. And then I've shown you here something what happened in 1950. Uh, this happened actually, the rise has been in the post-industrial era, uh, but in last 70 or 80 years, there's been a steep rise in the carbon dioxide concentration in the environment. And then the second thing I said about the rapid depletion, uh, you can see that uh, by end of this century, there will be no lithium available for extraction. And I think uh, this is important to note because I don't think there is any pocket in the audience which does not carry a lithium ion battery in the pocket. Uh, and the same thing also applies to rare earths, which are so very important for the modern electronics. And once again, there is no gadget that any one of the lis listeners or participants in this uh, virtual meeting uh, is uh, present who doesn't have access to rare earth based electronic devices. So you can see that if we run out of these resources, we are going to have a big difficulty. Uh, you know, periodic table has been the bugbear of uh, all the students and even of chemistry people. But uh, three years ago, a new periodic table has been proposed. I am not going to go to the details, but you see, this is more colorful periodic table. It is colorful because now it is possible to identify the elements which will disappear in 100 years. It is possible to identify elements which are under great threat and they will disappear in the next few hundred years. So it is not appropriate that 90 natural elements that make everything on our planet, everything on our planet is composed of these 90 elements, but some of them are going to disappear forever in not infinite time scales, but in the next few centuries. Uh, so we are gauging as a resource stressed, stressed planet. And I will tell you why it is important. You know, the legacy, the greatest legacy of humankind, the le greatest legacy of our planet are the elemental resources. And these elemental resources came at the time of the Big Bang, the event that created the universe. That was 13 billion years ago. 
it is not possible to create elements today. No chemical element is replaceable. Of course, as chemists, we can always say that uh, we can carry out nuclear reactions and generate new elements, but you know that those elements have at best lifetime of few seconds or minutes, and you can only make them in microscopic quantities. You cannot generate new elements. So if elements disappear, there will never be a uh, replacement for them. So there is important message for chemists, policymakers, other scientists is that we must as scientific community uh, assume the stewardship of elements and pursuit of sustainability and some of the things that I may say are actually uh, to exercise elemental stewardship and restraint. And of course, it will also in turn ensure material sustainability. So slightly, let me switch some gears and I'll ask a question. Are we staring at a man-made crisis? Yes, my answer is categorical yes. But possibly we have not reached yet a point of no return. We are now approaching tipping points of planetary boundaries. And uh, many of you may not be familiar with this, uh, the concept of uh, planetary boundaries. I will not dwell on this too much, but simply say that scientists have identified nine critical boundaries to remain sustainable. At least four of them in, as ozone depletion, which you know is related to global warming, climate change, biodiversity loss, and nutrient pollution, we have reached a threshold beyond which the situation may become irretrievable. And uh, you can see this uh, graphic that I have shows uh, what you see in the yellow uh, portion of this graphic is that we are reaching uh, planetary tipping points. There have been two recent wake-up calls, global wake-up calls, and again, uh, most of our policymakers and of course many in our scientific community, uh, including chemists, are not yet familiar with this. But these are the startling facts. That's why I said these are wake up calls. You know, a study appeared uh, a couple of years ago. This is from uh, uh, Israel. And just try to comprehend what it is saying. Global human made mass, which you can call as anthropogenic mass, exceeds living biomass in the planet. And you know that the bio, uh, the uh, chemical uh, mass which is produced uh, on the planet is through chemical processing. Many of them are unsustainable. So the point is we are producing more mass on the planet every year than nature produces through its photosynthesis, biosynthesis and other normal natural uh, processes. It's unthinkable. It's mind boggling. But this is the situation which exists today. And I can give you uh, another flavor of some numbers for comparison. All humanity, all humanity on our planet, 8 billion plus people, only account for 0.01% of global biomass. So we produce every year 100 times material as compared to our own mass. Is it sustainable? It's a question to ask. Obviously, the answer is very obvious. I just want to give you another flavor. Uh, we produce 300 million tons of plastic waste every year, 300 million tons, uh, tons, which is almost equal to the total weight of human population. So we produce one waste, plastic waste every year, which exceeds the weight of all humans on the planet. I mean, I'm sure if you think a little bit, you'll find it very strange what kind of living we have on our planet. Okay. There's another very interesting study that uh, has appeared last year, uh, which shows that the safe operating space of novel entities has already been exceeded. Means if you create now new materials, new entities, new chemical processing, we are now operating beyond the threshold of planetary boundary. Again, you have to ask, is it sustainable? Is it worth doing? And an editorial appeared a few months ago in the Royal Society of Chemistry journal, uh, which says 
majority of top chemicals in market deemed unsustainable by this metric, the new metric which has been proposed. So all I'm saying is to practicing chemists, there is very little scope for you to pursue traditional chemistry and generate new chemical uh, entities. Uh, I can't resist the temptation of showing you this uh, recent uh, photograph that you see at the top. This is a photograph taken by Perseverance rover on Mars uh, on July 19, 2022. And I have circled an object which has been photographed from the uh, Perseverance rover and sent to the Earth. Uh, they call it a spaghetti-like object, but there is little doubt that this is some plastic coated wiring which might have fallen during the landing of the space vehicle on the Mars surface, but it is there. And uh, like all plastic, God knows how long it will be there. And now we have started polluting and creating uh, issues uh, beyond our own planet on Mars. Of course, I'm sure you are aware of the fact that uh, this year for the first time, microplastics have been identified in the fresh snow on Antarctica. You know, uh, the Antarctic uh, snow now has, so it is not something which is traversed, but it is in the environment because that is how it is in the Antarctic snow that you see microplastics. And of course, you know that the Great, great Barrier Reefs um, are in great danger, but in fact, all coral reefs, as you can see here, is catching plastic. And, uh, you know, this is one of the great wonders of our planet, the, the coral reefs, and uh, it is under threat. Okay, so now let's ask, all this has been happening for quite some time. What has been the global responses to sustainability? Well, there have been early warnings, but the world has been very slow to recognize because we were living in an era where everything seems hunky-dory because lifestyles were enhancing, things were readily available, and so on. And we have lost decades. Uh, I've tried to trace when will was the first uh, alert sounded. Uh, many of you might have heard the name Buckminster Fuller. If not Fuller, all chemists know what fullerenes are because fullerenes are the harbingers of uh, the uh, nanotech and nanoscience uh, era. He was an architect, not a chemist, but a great thinker. He wrote a book, and I want you to think for a moment on the title of this book. He said, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. He said, Earth cannot be left unnavigated, just as a ship cannot be left unnavigated. Earth has to be navigated, not in the social, political, and economic arena, but it also has to be navigated with regard to the survival of the planet and survival of human beings. Then a group of uh, very enlightened scholars and thinkers met uh, in Rome in 1972. Many of you might have heard. Uh, it is called Club of Rome, and they prepared a very interesting report and followed it up over the years with so many reports. I don't need to cover that. But the title is important. So we had people on our planet, great thinkers, great scholars who thought of what was coming, but we didn't act. The book is Limits of Growth, and I'm sure many of you have heard about it because it's a very popular and very highly regarded uh, book, Limits of Growth. And then, of course, a major change occurred in 1987 because of the efforts of the United Nations when the Brundtland Commission actually first coined the word sustainability. And they wrote a very, very uh, foresightful uh, report. The title is beautiful, Our Common Future. So when we talk about sustainability, we are not talking of geographies. We are not talking about ethnicity, religion, and other things. This is common future of all humans and our planet. Well, for the, us Indians, we didn't need to be taught all this. The father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, had said 100 years ago, the context might have been different, but the message was very clear. Gandhi had said, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. As I said, the context might have been different, but messages were telling and related 
to the ideas of sustainability that emerged almost 70 years after Gandhi had said this. Okay. Well, let's now look at the silver lining. Um, there has been a remarkable change in last uh, six or seven years. Uh, you are all familiar or at least heard of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, 2015 to 2030, a major stepping stone towards the sustainability of uh, people uh, and the planet. Uh, for my chemistry colleagues, I want to say that six of these 17 goals map directly into chemical sciences. There have been uh, parallel efforts also along with the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Uh, there is now a formal framework to address the issue of uh, climate change. Some of you who look beyond your own discipline, worry about the world, look about how our planet is shaping up. I'm sure you have heard about these meetings call, called COP1226. And there is uh, some beginning, baby steps. For example, uh, European Union has launched a Horizons Europe research program. And this is aimed at having 100 cities attaining carbon neutrality by 2030. Now, I'll just spend a moment a little later to explain what carbon neutrality means. So there is already a program to convert at least 100 cities in Europe, make them carbon neutrality. So it's a baby step towards sustainability. And uh, just a couple of months back in March 2022, uh, all countries in the United Nations have committed themselves that they will uh, address the issue of full life cycle of plastics from production, design, and disposal to end and end plastic pollution by 2024. I mean, it, this is a very, very ambitious goal. You walk the streets in our country and you think about plastics will be completely eliminated by 2020. It sounds utopian, but this is a very ambitious goal like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and one wishes that it will be achieved. Just a minute uh, about how our country is responding. Uh, I would say our country is responding quite well, uh, proactively. I'll just give you uh, two or three, two examples here. For uh, instance, India is fully committed on the way of uh, meeting sustainability development goals. And uh, if you follow what is happening around, you will know that uh, many, many steps uh, are being taken, which map into sustainability development goals. Uh, chemistry wise, we are taking note of it, but uh, chemistry is not yet fully geared towards pursuit of sustainability development goals in India or even globally. And that's why it is important that chemists take note of it. And that's why I endeavor to give lectures on this uh, topic. Uh, but India's one major statement was that in, in November 2021, uh, at uh, the COP21, means the word uh, is called actually uh, Committee of Partners to address the uh, issue of uh, global warming. India made a commitment that by 20, and this is fantastic. I mean, you know, very, very audacious, if you can say, that by 2070, India will become net zero. Uh, I'm not going to dwell, but to understand what zero means is that greenhouse gas emissions, which contribute to global warming. So you will see here the word GHD, this is greenhouse gas emissions, will be balanced by those which are absorbed. So whatever greenhouse gases we are going to uh, eliminate uh, through the processing will be neutralized by what which will be taken out. This is very, very ambitious, something to be very much appreciated that our country is committed to this. Why am I talking to uh, you, uh, mostly community, chemistry community and others is because these changes offer one in a century opportunity for chemistry and for practicing interdisciplinarity beyond preaching interdisciplinarity. So what we really need is decarbonization of economy and chemical processing. Okay, so. I share my optimism that chemistry can redeem and chemistry can deliver the challenge of sustainability. And one way 
to make sure that everybody walks the talk, goes along that route, is to project chemistry as sustainability science. So, let me raise this question. If, you, if that is the ambition, if you are optimistic, chemistry can. How must chemistry change, readapt, and reinvent? And I have a wish list here. This is my personal wish, wish list. Very difficult to achieve. We have written an editorial in Nature in 2016, which you can see at the bottom. A, a group of us, whom we call C4S, and uh, Professor Bhattacharya referred to it. Uh, we have some audacious game changing suggestion and at first time chemists may think that we are we are nuts well we may be um one of the things we should do is it possible to do chemistry and chemical transformations without chemical reagents because the first thing you go to a chemistry laboratory is a shelf with a lot of chemical reagents is it possible to do chemistry without chemical reagents my view is possible but until that time comes can chemistry be made wasteless and implemented with full circularity? That is one way forward. So, you know, we have all heard about a lot of talk about green chemistry and so on. Green chemistry is important. Uh, green chemistry has some place. But green chemistry is not substitute for circular chemistry. And green chemistry by itself is not enough, not adequate. We need uh, circular chemistry, and I'll just show you a graphic uh, how chemical chemistry manufacturing is done. And uh, please pay attention how it has been in the past. And I have tried to simplify it so that everybody can get it. Chemistry culture has been take, make, use, dispose, pollute. Let me again repeat take, make, use, dispose, pollute. This is how we have been practicing chemistry. What is required in circular chemistry is make, use, reuse, remake, recycle, make, use, reuse, make, recycle. There is no place for pollution, there is no place for disposal, and there is no place for uh, uh, polluting. And so you can see this is a circular process, uh, but this will not happen just because you are seeing a graphic or somebody has made this graphic with uh, interesting possibilities. It will happen because all chemists must undergo a strategic and conceptual shift. And one way to do this and to differentiate it from green chemistry and move towards circular chemistry is green chemistry was anchored in atom economy. Now atom economy is inadequate. You have to put an atom in perpetual circulation from one material to another material to another material. And for that, you have to adopt new strategy, which should be restorative and regenerative design principles uh, should dictate making of new materials. Uh, I will not talk about the details of this, but equally important is we have to redefine waste. And I urge all of you chemists, scientists, whatever you are, there is no thing called waste. Please remove the word waste from your mind. And the reason why I say is chemical matter only changes form. So waste is a misplaced resource. Waste is a resource, but in a wrong place at a wrong time. So don't treat anything as waste. And therefore, you know, in business circles, you are very corporate people use a word called B2B, business to business. And I have adopted from this. So I say what chemists should do is Cradle to cradle, there is no graveyard for from cradle to grave, which is the usual expression. It is cradle to cradle, C to C through smart chemical design. That's the kind of transition that we must make. And uh, again, the popular culture is uh, throw away. Does anybody I challenge, and although I cannot match uh, the award that um, Professor Bala Subramaniam has instituted, but I will, I promise to institute an award if somebody can tell me where is this place called away. Okay, so please tell me where is this away when we say throw away. You know, you're walking on the street, you say, oh, this is no use, I have finished all my potato chips, what do I do? Throw away. 
where is the way? Never use the word away, never use the word waste. Okay, so this is the last part of my presentation. Um, just want to very quickly flash through uh, where are the opportunities for chemistry in sustainability, energy and environment, sustainable agriculture, I'll not go into the details, human health, advanced materials. They're all life enhancing and they will all have to be operated in a circular mode and in uh, without uh, contributing anything to uh, the pollution and other after effects. So uh, this is a, a paper that we have uh, just written, just came a couple of months back. You can see the reference where we say that chemistry should not be a solution provider only. Chemistry should also develop resilience to planetary system. Chemistry should pro promote adaptation and chemistry must ensure that we can secure the planetary boundaries. And then chemistry will really serve the purpose which is expected of it. Okay, uh, and I'll give you two or three examples of how chemistry for transition to a less carbonized future. And I will tell you these examples are known to everybody in high school, but we don't take note of it because we live in the imaginary world and not real world. Uh, I will therefore deal with two contextual challenges and raise a question. A challenge for chemistry. Can we have an ammonia synthesis at room temperature? And remember, 96% of hydrogen which is used in ammonia comes from fossil fuels. Can we find a sustainable clean source for hydrogen? And even those who are not chemists will know why I am talking about it, because the numbers will tell you. You know, uh, the world uh, population is expected to reach 9 billion by 2050. 40 to 60 percent of our food production requires heavy dose of fertilizers. So why ammonia? Because ammonia converts into urea and I'm sure the urea you're all very familiar. There'll be no urea without ammonia. So ammonia is the basic building block for urea. It's very easy to transform uh, urea into uh, ammonia. And Mind you, again, this number. Ammonia production accounts for nearly 2% of global energy. 2% of global energy goes into making six, uh, making one molecule. One molecule, small, you can't even see, but it consumes 2% of global uh, energy. It also, of course, uh, produces matching carbon dioxide during its manufacture. So this has to change and chemistry can only enable this change in partnership with engineering, technology and so on. So is it possible to have an ambient ammonia synthesis? Why I am talking about this? I am sure every learner of chemistry has learned in the high school, the Haber process or the Haber wash process, which is combination of nitrogen with hydrogen to give ammonia carried out at about 600 degrees centigrade high pressure of this thing. That's why it's an ener energy guzzler. It consumes 2% of world's energy, nearly 2% of it. But science has advanced, chemistry has advanced. Uh, we had a very interesting report a couple of years back, almost 100 years after the Haber synthesis of ammonia, which says that at 50 degrees and at 1 to 10 atmospheric pressure, much, 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 milder conditions, less energy, it is possible to convert uh, nitrogen and hydrogen into ammonia. This is only POC. This is only proof of concept. We are far, far away from implementing it on a substantial scale. There are many other developments and uh, I want our chemistry colleagues to take note of it. Uh, you know, in catalysis, there is a huge development called single atom catalysis. One atom can catalyze a process. One atom can catalyze a process referred to as single atom catalysis for the future. And this gives us a lot of hope. And people have been building scenarios for ambient room temperature synthesis of uh, ammonia. Uh, there's a very recent uh, article in Catalysis today, and this uh, graphic summarizes uh, the various approaches that are being adopted. And uh, just last week, uh, a paper appeared in print 
uh, which says that it is possible to do electrode reduction of nitrogen with 100% current to ammonia efficiency. So there are big developments taking place. And uh, again, why I have spent so much time? Because this is the biggest uh, challenge in chemical sciences today. How to access uh, ammonia? And of course, before ammonia comes, you need access to hydrogen. So I'm sure you must have been uh, hearing these days about different colors of hydrogen. Uh, for when you use the, read the newspapers, people talk about green hydrogen, people talk about brown hydrogen or dirty hydrogen, people talk about gray hydrogen or not so uh, good hydrogen and so on. Now, you all know, again, this is high school chemistry, that the best way to produce hydrogen cleanly, green hydrogen, is by doing solar photoelectrolysis of water. If you can split water into hydrogen next oxygen using sunlight, that's the way to get access to green hydrogen and unlimited source of hydrogen because you use water to produce hydrogen and when you burn that hydrogen, your water is recovered. Uh, you know, a very well-known professor in MIT uh, using this principle, he said, if it can demonstrate then the water in the swimming pool of MIT, water in the swimming pool of MIT can take care of the all energy needs of United States because you can make it circular, you can recycle. So that's the kind of thinking uh, which is now required and it's the kind of huge objective that has to be met, okay? And of course, uh, there have been uh, big advance by using nanotechnology, particularly graphene-based nanomaterials uh, to facilitate solar electrolysis. Uh, chemistry's contributions have been great uh, in terms of, and also uh, the opportunities are great because uh, uh, one simple number will show you. It is believed that antibiotics alone have increased lifespan by 20 years. Life expectancy, you saw how it has jumped from 30 to 73 in few centuries. Chemistry in last 100 years has contributed to increase the lifespan by 20 years. And of course, you all know that when the AIDS pandemic came, it has been conquering malaria substantially, uh, tuberculosis and so on. And today, you know, we are sitting on another volcano. Uh, if you read for last week, uh, newspapers, you might have seen that no antibiotic is now working very efficiently against infections. It's the antibiotics that eliminated infections. Now, hospital deaths and what is generally known as AMR, which is uh, antimicrobial resistance, is developing that no antibiotic works. I don't need to dwell in the, this at the moment, but if it's chemistry audience, I'll tell you what is the challenge and what are the possible opportunities. Okay, so this is the last part. Uh, this is for contemplation. Uh, and uh, this is really meant for uh, how we can enable chemistry's march towards sustainability uh, through teaching learning processes. So we have to reinvent chemistry teaching learning in 21st century. Uh, we need a new pedagogy. The problem that we have uh, deliberately or inadvertently done with chemistry teaching in the past several decades is we have emphasized on the content and not on the context. And there is an imbalance in content and context. What we need to do about chemistry education is that we need to rebalance content and context. Uh, there have been a long-standing flaw with chemistry teaching and chemistry education, and that is we have not adopted systems thinking. You know, in engineering, systems thinking is basic. There are many moving parts, so you have to take care. You have to have a system thinking. Biology adopted systems thinking about three decades ago, but chemists have ignored it, have been blind, rather, to this opportunity. And you will see two references where we have uh, written recently that chemistry must adopt systems thinking, enhance contextualization, and interdisciplinarity, which is unique to chemistry. Interdisciplinarity unlimited is the hallmark of chemistry. We must adopt it and do this. Um, there are other things, but I will not go into this. We have also proposed the idea of one world chemistry. 
uh, which which follows you know the ideas of one health and so on and so forth. But the I think this conversation, this cartoon, I will use to highlight why there is an urgent need for uh, reinventing chemistry teaching and chemistry curriculum. So we said the message or the objective is rip chemistry curriculum. And these two uh, people are having this conversation. Uh, one guy says the chemistry curriculum is just like a graveyard. I don't fully agree with you, but he's capturing the spirit. Okay. Uh, the other man says, yes, it is full of dead bodies. Uh, and that's why it is a graveyard. But I think uh, we are uh, not fully dead yet. And this is what the other person says now. But they have lots of friends who are still alive. So, my friends, let's make the best use of the fact that we are still around and reinvent the chemistry curriculum. Uh, I also want to very quickly uh, emphasize the fact that the future of chemistry is ethical science. There is not enough time now to dwell on some of these things, but the future of any science, for example, uh, is um, by following certain ethical standards. But chemistry is many times accused for creating pollution, spoiling the atmosphere, releasing carbon dioxide, and so on. It is important that practice of chemistry should be uh, aligned to the, the ethics values of the time. And uh, another point important is to value diversity. Uh, we have again, we wrote an invited uh, article, uh, editorial, uh, on the importance of diversity. And as I mentioned, uh, we also believe that uh, cultural competence in science is very, very important, uh, also in chemistry and for enhancing equality, diversity, and inclusion. And I'll just give you one example. You know, there's a lot of problem these days of plagiarism, for example, uh, cooking data, unreliable data. It's not only chemistry in other areas as well. And therefore, the response of the uh, governments, the response of the regulatory bodies is to have more regulation. Our view is that integrity in research is more about culture than compliance. And it is important that research integrity and uh, research culture should be aligned completely. You cannot have research unless integrity is an essential element of this research. And of course, in the times of overwhelming presence of social media and other uh, connectivities that we have in the society, it is very important that cultural, every learner is empowered, including chemistry learner, is empowered uh, with uh, cultural competencies. This will also go a long way in uh, handling what is these days called fake philia, dichotomania, and so on. So, so all these diseases can be handled if we enhance cultural competencies. Okay, this is, I think, my last slide. Uh, I wish to make a very strong pitch for humility. Humility is essential in science. Humility is also equally essential in chemistry. Uh, and I show you here the example of uh, Marie Curie. Uh, again, two times Nobel Prize winner in both physics and chemistry. You know her well. Uh, you know, Einstein, was asked to comment on what kind of a person Marie Curie was. And Einstein is believed to have re remarked that she was the only person who was not corrupted by fame, that she had one. Well, think about it. We are all looking for little crumbs, little visibility, little words of appreciation. Here is a woman who got two Nobel Prizes, but had no effect of that fame on her. Uh, to put it very simply, I have here a quote from uh, Dan Shackman. Many of you might know he uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2011 for discovery of quasi-crystals, a new form of matter, uh, and very eminent person. He simply said, a good scientist is a humble scientist. And I think we should follow, try to emulate and follow this. If you are good, you have to be humble. It may be applicable to all, every human being, but at least as scientists, we should make sure that we follow this principle of humility. We don't have to look in um, Europe and we don't have to look, uh, Shekman is from Israel. In Israel, we have a great example to emulate in our own country. 
uh, of Acharya de T.C. Ray. He was father of chemistry and chemical industry in India. And he's well known for, the, some, uh, for an individual who would integrate ideas with idealism, which is very difficult. Think about it a little bit. And more importantly, he has left us a venerable legacy of humility and patriotism. Worth emulating. Uh, so this is the last slide, definitely. Uh, I raise a question. Why have I taken you through this unusual journey? You know, I have given a chemistry talk, talk without showing you a simple chemical structure. Only the ammonia synthesis I show you. Why have I done this? And so mark my reasoning. Uh, and I'll read out few sentences that I have. We are where we are due to 4 billion years of evolutionary revolution. I think many of you know that first primitive life form on our planet, primitive life form on our planet, which is obviously a chemical, uh, amino acid synthesis and so on, happened 4 billion years. And then we have gone through this evolutionary revolution to end up at humans that we are able to talk today. Four billion years of evolutionary revolution. The point that we have to now think about it, not the past. Sustainability challenges now mandate revolution in evolution. We were, we were prisoners, we are beneficiaries of evolutionary revolution. But now we need revolution in evolution. And in that revolution, humans should be humble. Humans should recognize what our position is in the planetary ecosystem. And therefore, we must adopt the strategy to survive and coexist. And when I say coexist, it's not in political term, coexist with other nations and other people and other countries. Coexist here is with all living forms on our planet. And we must recognize the fact that we are just one tiny bit of life in this gigantic diversified planet of ours. So to enable that, chemistry must evolve from a molecular world to face planetary challenges. So thank you for your kind attention. Uh, I acknowledge people who have been supporting. Uh, <coughs> I've been fortunate last uh, 12 years or so. I, I don't seek and I'm not supported by uh, any public funding. I get uh, all corporate funding for my research. Thank you very much.